Diversity, equity, and inclusion are central to our business. A long-term commitment to this work enabled progress over the years, and we are setting clear goals and strategies that will accelerate progress on the journey ahead. As a purpose-driven organization with more than a half a million employees who live and work in more than 220 territories and countries, UPS believes our culture should reflect the diversity and inclusion that thrives inside and outside of our walls. Our rallying cry is, you belong at UPS, and it extends across our company, from the leaders in our headquarters to the drivers in our delivery vehicles, and every UPSer in between. It represents our commitment to building a more inclusive and equitable UPS, and a more inclusive and equitable world. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is also about leadership representation, and it starts at the top. Our board of directors models that commitment with 31% ethnically and racially diverse members and 46% women. Women's empowerment is a core value at UPS. We are focused on creating opportunities within our workforce and empowering women in businesses and communities around the globe. UPS's Women's Leadership Development and Women's in Operations Business Resource Groups have been leading the way in developing and advancing our people impacting our communities, and driving inclusion. As UPS proudly celebrates Women's History Month and International Women's Day, we recognize our progress while realizing there is more that can and will be done. Let's hear from UPS CEO, Carol Tomei, and our female board members as they dive into the topic of allyship. You know, I, I've been working, I think, for 40 years now, and I have been a member of so many women's groups over that time frame. And we would get together, and I, I love the sisterhood, I love getting together with the women, but we would talk about the need to advance women forward into more senior roles in corporate America, and we would just talk, we would sell hat, hats amongst ourselves. And I'm like, you know, I think we're talking to the wrong people here. Shouldn't we be talking to the people who are making those decisions? And sadly, most of them are not us. So, you know, it's really this concept of allyship and, you know, he for she, who else do we need to work with to, to advance the, 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 um, the opportunity forward? And I'd love to hear from all of you about allyship, how we could best leverage that here at, at UPS. And maybe, Anne, we start with you on that. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, interesting. I had really uh, probably a lucky situation uh, spending most of my career at HP because HP was a place that was always focused on rewarding people for the results that they create. And it didn't matter what you look like. Uh, it mattered what you got done and how you got it done. Uh, I can remember one of my favorite bosses when I was doing my first presentation for the CEO staff. And he was there in the meeting with me. And about a third of the way through, he slammed his fist down on the table. And everybody kind of startled, you know, the 90% of the people there who were men all were kind of startled in their seats. And he said, did you all just listen to what she said? He said, say it again, Anne. So I said it again. And he said, that's the most important thing that's been said all day. So I had a boss who made a point of when women were speaking, making sure people listen to them. And I still do that. And I did that my whole life at HP. When I felt like somebody wasn't really being paid attention to, making a little bit of, of a spectacle out of them needing to be heard. And I think it's most effectively done by whoever it is in the organization that's respected. And there are a lot of women who are highly respected in their organization. There are a lot of men. And I think it can be even more impactful sometimes when it's the man who slams his fist on the table and says, you need to listen to her. Well, and you didn't ask him to, to do that. He did that for you because he's a, a sponsor, a mentor, thought you were doing amazing things. Should we ask for that? Yeah. Well, I think if you're not in an environment where people naturally do that, you should ask someone, you should start by asking someone to give you feedback. Yeah, After the course, meeting's course. over today, can you tell me what I could have done differently? And I think you start with that. 
And um, then the men can be, men and other people can be coached into they should do that in meetings. I think it's better to go that route. That's at least my preferred route in terms of starting with the feedback and uh, then asking for the support. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Kate, how about you? What's your, your point of view on allyship? So it, it's essential um, to solving the problem. And I think you're absolutely right. It's, everybody's, it, it's a responsibility that should be incumbent upon everybody in the community, period, full stop. And what we learned was that uh, as two things, number one, it's not natural for everybody to do it. It was natural for Anne's boss, but he is mm-hmm. unfortunately in a very small minority. And it takes recognizing the problem, which means there needs to be sort of broad recognition that there is a problem and that problem needs to be characterized with meaningful examples. And so, you know, I hate to to say, oh, everybody's going to be trained, but there does need to be a significant amount of communication about what the problem actually is with specific examples in a way that, that people can really absorb. And then the second thing is it might not come naturally, but everybody can learn it. And one of the stumbling blocks that we found was vulnerability is at the heart of the problem. People don't want to be vulnerable in front of their peers and stick their neck out for somebody else in a group setting. It's just not a natural thing that we've trained people over decades to do in the boardroom, unfortunately. Uh, It's getting there, but we're not there yet. And so um, rolling out training that really sort of speaks to these core skills of being able to have difficult conversations having courage, understanding that vulnerability is not weakness. It's the exact opposite. It's strength. It's the first step to listening and actually understanding something. That's critical. And that's not just training men or the majority represented group. That's training everybody in that way so that we can actually drive connection in every single direction at every single level of the company. Yeah, that that makes so much sense to me, really being comfortable being vulnerable and support people through that vulnerable and vulnerability so that they can continue to grow. Isn't part of it, though, helping people understand their unconscious biases? Christiana, what do you think about that? Do you think that's part of the challenge? What I have found helpful when you're talking about unconscious biases is to be willing to bring in an observer, an objective third party, periodically to just See how you're doing on on walking that talk. And, you know, the example is, I mentioned it earlier, reviewing your reviews, right? Which is basically saying, let's look at at our personnel processes. Let's have somebody come in and look at the decisions we've made. Let's let's have someone sit in on our advancement and, and, um, uh, you know, promotional meetings when we're looking at, you know, what kind of organizational changes we're going to make. And you know there there are organizations that do that. McKinsey brought someone like that in, and it's it's really helpful because you can you'll it surfaces things like again because it's unconscious you 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 miss it. It surfaces things like when we are making a promotional decision or an advancement decision amongst two or three internal candidates, who gets the benefit of the doubt, and who do we say? Let's give them six more months, you know, yeah. in role before we before we move them. That may be you may find that that is, in fact, a very balanced discussion. You may find that very often the risk or the benefit of the doubt is perceived to be more challenging when someone doesn't fit whatever the norm is, you know, in your organization. So I find it is helpful to do training and raise awareness, but then check yourself periodically. And that's best done with someone a bit outside the process who, who can actually look and see if there are additional opportunities. Yeah, I, I love that, having someone sit in with you. I, I think that's a super good idea. Angela, how about you? What do you think about allyship? Well, like Kate, I, um, I like the word she used. I think it's essential. Um, but I think about allyship, you know, broadly, um, not just not just males or men, it's it's really about the support system around us and really how to engage, you know, at multiple levels. And, um, you know, picking up on, on a theme that I think we've surfaced here today, you know, is the importance of, you know, transparency, whether it's transparency yes. around a goal, transparency around a problem, you know, you know whatever it is. But 
Um, just to give an example of how you can create that transparency, you know, one of the things we do here at Pfizer is that whenever there is an opening, um, we ask the hiring manager to to uh, create a slate. So out of the job, you know, whoever may be applying for the job, right? And we ask that before any interviews are conducted, that that slate is diverse. That slate represents different minority groups, men, women, different kinds of experiences. Like you think about diversity in its broadest sense. And so before yeah. anyone yeah. sits down and interviews anybody, do we like the slate that we have? Do we believe that the slate truly represents our company, what the, the, the role needs, so on and so forth. And um, that, that is an example of the kind of transparency that you can, um, you can stimulate, right? And to have a good discussion, because when you actually look at that slate, you then may realize, gosh, I may not have the right people represented. It's not just gender, it could just be experience. And that kind of, um, uh, you know, th this kind of process ultimately and, and eventually sort of builds into the culture that you're trying to create, which is we should be able to look at our organization and we should be able to for everyone to stand behind um, the importance of creating diverse workforces. And this allyship comes from so many different places, right? But it begins with, I think, having a really strong culture and any way that any one of us can find to um, to create the transparency, to create a venue for us to have these conversations over time. This is what creates the strength behind the conversation and, and the ability to drive change. Yeah, no, I, I think we all, well, I see everyone's head nodding on that for, for sure. And again, it's coming back down to intentionality. Everything is, it's gotta be intentional about all of these actions. Eva, do you see it any differently? Any other thoughts on allyship that we should consider? I think everyone really covered it, Carol, but I wanna go back to a word that you use that I think is also important in this dialogue about sponsorship and yes. mentorship, but more so sponsorship. Yes. And if you just listen to the other conversations, right? and. And who do we give that chance to? Are they ready or not? That's where sponsorship can really can really help advance that that um, that dialogue. And and Kate used the word vulnerabilities. And going back to to Anne's very positive example, if you took Anne's example and flipped it the other way. Who has the confidence to go up to the person who behaved badly and shut down others, maybe privately, and say, come on, you, you stepped out, you know, do you realize you did X, Y, and Z? Yeah. And sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's really not. And this, this knowledge, right, this intention and, and these things, it's, it's bi-directional. 